Hi there everyone, Mrs. King here. Today I'm here to read to you chapter four of Riding Freedom. I am hoping that you've been enjoying the other chapters and the other videos. I don't um, have another video ready for you for this week yet, but I'm hoping that it is on here by the time that you get this chapter and it will also clarify some terms like the color of horses and what a stagecoach is. So we'll see if that becomes available. But um, at the end of chapter three, Charlotte had just run away from the orphanage and she was looking to catch that stagecoach. So in chapter four, we will see what happens next. All right, let's get you a good spot on my couch and we'll get started. Chapter four, before dawn, Charlotte came upon the wooden sign for Concord. She stopped and gathered some rocks and piled them up around the base. She pictured Vern riding into town next week and seeing her signal, nodding his head and smiling to himself. At least she hoped it would be that way. She still had to get on the stage without getting caught. Charlotte sat on the bench in front of the library office and ate the sandwich Vern had packed. A sign in the window said southbound coach 6 o'clock a.m. Charlotte figured that with luck, Mrs. Boyle wouldn't know for sure that she was gone until about 7 o'clock a.m. By that time, she just had to be far enough away. When the ticket office opened, she gathered Vern's coins and bought a one-way to Manchester. Charlotte's heart leaped when she heard the pounding hooves. She looked toward the end of the road where it led into town. Then, out of a dust cloud, she saw the horses. Harnessed, six handsome, great-limbed horses trotted toward her. They were mostly gray mustangs, but there was one bay and a sorrel like freedom. Healthy and well-tended, they seemed eager to work in the traces that wove them together. Behind them, the driver sat atop the stagecoach, holding the reins in perfect control. Charlotte had heard about six and eight horses being hitched at one time, but she'd never seen it. That, what would it feel like to have that many horses step to your call? The driver yelled, whoa, and the horses slowed. There was a jingling and rattling and creaking when the coach settled in front of the hotel. The pressure brake screeched as the driver secured the wheels. The coach gleamed with varnish. In the morning sun, the wheels were painted yellow and printed on the doors were the words U.S. Mail. It was the most beautiful thing that Charlotte had ever seen. She walked over and rubbed her hand across the shiny hickory wood. Then she petted the horse that reminded her too much of freedom. The driver assigned the seats right away. Charlotte climbed aboard and found herself wedged between two plump women. Hello there, young man, said one of the women. Charlotte nodded. I'm Mrs. Mapes, and this is Mrs. Earhart, my traveling companion. What's your name? Charlotte stared blankly at Mrs. Mapes. My name, she asked. Yes, your name, dear. Charlie, said Charlotte. My name's Charlie. Well, Charlie, it's nice to meet you. We're traveling to the end of the line, so I guess we're in for a long ride together. Yes, ma'am, said Charlotte, and pulled the cap tighter over her, over her head. The stage began rolling and rocking over the countryside. Charlotte watched farms and lush woods moving across the coach window. She wished she could sit up top with the driver so she could see more. Watch him drive the team. Ask him about the horse's names. She felt excited as if something new and good was about to happen. What was Hayward doing today? Waking up in his new home. She would have a home someday, but not if she stayed at the orphanage. Millshark and Mrs. Boyle would have seen to that. Now she felt certain that anything was possible. Vern used to say that plants can't breathe and grow in a box that's too tight. Now she knew what he meant. Soon Charlotte fell sound asleep against Mrs. Mates. She woke up now and then, but with the two ladies droning on with their gossip, 
and the rocking of the stagecoach, she quickly slipped back into her slumber, happy to be traveling farther and farther away from the orphanage. It was hours later when the stage pulled into the end of the line in Worcester, Massachusetts. Why hadn't someone woken Charlotte up? and made her get off sooner. She didn't recognize the driver. Drivers must have changed at one of the stops. Maybe he thought she was with the two women. She had fallen asleep against one of them. Here's a picture of Charlotte asleep. Or Charlie, we now know her. After the new driver helped the passengers out of the cramped coach, Charlotte stretched and stood in the street, looking up one side and down the other. Guests headed toward the hotel and their, and their satchels, sorry, with their satchels and luggage. A burst of laughter erupted from the pub. People came and went from the shops on the street, some in fancier clothes than Charlotte had ever seen. The other passengers drifted away to their destinations and Charlotte soon found herself alone on the side of the road. What should she do with herself? She'd run away, but she had nowhere to go, really. She didn't know a soul. She had no money except for a few remaining coins. She hadn't thought, thought this far. It was getting dark and suddenly she felt frightened and lonely. Charlotte went over and stroked the horses. At least they felt familiar. The driver came around and started leading the team towards the livery. Want some help? asked Charlotte. The driver began on hitching the team. No, thank ye. I take care of my horses myself, but you're welcome to watch me put them to bed. The driver chuckled. Boys and horses can't seem to keep them apart. Charlotte followed him into the stable and watched him take the harnesses off the horses rubbed the horses down, and put them in their stalls. I can cart some water for you, said Charlotte. Good boy, do it then. Charlotte hauled buckets of water to the stalls, talking to the horses as she went. Then she helped the driver fork in the straw. You're right handy with them chores, he said. Yes, sir, said Charlotte. You live around here? No, sir. Well, I just moved to these parts. Well, get along now. I'll be closing the barn. Charlotte backed away and moved toward the main door, stopping and petting each horse as she went. It was safe here. She looked around and noticed the lofts above her. When the driver disappeared into the tack room to hang up some bridles, Charlotte took a chance. As fast as she could, she climbed up a ladder and flung herself into the loft. She kept her head down and lay there without moving or making a sound. Her heart was pounding as loud as a drum beating. Could the driver hear it too? He was below her now, whistling and finishing his chores. Finally, he walked out and shut the big barn doors for the night. Charlotte peeked over the loft onto, into the stalls. Vern would be fussing a blue streak if he saw how poorly these stalls were kept. She wasn't that tired, but she was hungry. She climbed down and started nosing around the barn. There, wa there wasn't a bite of food anywhere. Out of habit, she picked up a rake and started cleaning a stall. Then she straightened the bridles in the tack room. Later, she climbed back into the loft. Her stomach growled and complained, but finally, she slept. She dreamed about mush and potatoes and soap. The next morning, Charlotte woke to the sounds of a busy stable. Stock tenders called to one another. Bridles and traces jangled. The stable master barked out orders. Charlotte peered over the edge of the loft and barely moved. She couldn't just climb down and appear. They might throw her out. She listened to the comings and goings for some hours until things settled down. Maybe it was lunchtime. When no one was moving about and all she could hear was the blow and whinnies of the horses, she pushed up the loft window. It opened into a low roof. She quietly climbed out, shinnied down a wooden support beam, and landed behind the main barn. Hungrier than she could ever remember, she went to the general store and with her remaining money, bought some apples. She kept hidden, mainly hidden, behind buildings, moving from place to place every hour or so. Before dark, she watched some boys having races in a field. It would have been easy to join them, 
easy to beat them all. But there were too many questions that Charlotte didn't want to answer. Besides, if Milshark were looking for, everyone would know about a new kid who could run circles around the rest. After the boys got called home for supper, she stayed hidden until dark settled in. She thought about the home-cooked meals they'd be eating. Several times she took out the kerchief that Vern had made for her and fingered the buttonholes. She wondered at all the places it had been and all the places it was going. When there was no more activity at the stable, she climbed back in the loft window and quietly waited until the barn was closed for the night. Again, she cleaned the stalls. She wondered how long she could keep doing this. And again, she had trouble sleeping, fitfully tossing in the hayloft with dreams of running and running and almost being caught. When she woke, someone was standing over her with a pitchfork aimed at her face. All right, my friends, the end there is getting pretty scary and nerve wracking, but we will have to see what happens in chapter five. I'll see you again shortly.